Hey y'all, it's Shit Post Friday. Ozzy cannot walk, Hard Rock builds another guitar-shaped hotel monstrosity, and Jimmy Page is the neighbor from hell, all next on Shit Post Friday. Hey, how's it going everybody? Brad Guitar just here on another Friday third in a row so we're on a bit of a roll here now using a different microphone this week i'm actually going to a 1961 sure 55 as did some work on this microphone in a video i'll put a link up here somewhere if you want to go check that video out uh i own a bunch of different microphones some old and some newer and i thought maybe we should uh use this opportunity different shit post fridays i will try some different microphones and we'll kind of go through and we'll get uh, your opinions on which one is the best one which one you liked best last week i used a tonor microphone that was sent to me by the company Tonor. That's this guy right here. Um, it was okay, but I found that in post-production, somewhere along the line, I was getting a lot of just weird, um, almost like MP3 kind of compression noises. I am using a compressor, as you can probably hear. It's pretty compressed, and also it's got a noise gate so i'm using the alesis uh compressor compressor noise gate i'm also using a bbe sonic maximizer uh before it gets to the uh, interface and it's going to the computer from there the thing about the tonor is it had kind of a lot of uh noise issues uh like handling noise and you know this microphone does too to be fair um, but this one really has kind of a, a distinctive uh, handling noise that i, I kind of don't like so you got to really be uh careful around this one in particular and plus it's, pr it's a pretty hot microphone but like i said we'll try some different ones and see which one you like best give me some comments down below maybe go back and look at last week's i'll put a link up there uh, also to last week's and you can just kind of compare and contrast what the sound is like and uh let me know your opinion okay first up in the news i saw this story Ozzy cannot walk, or at least he's having a hard time walking, uh, to the point where he doesn't know if he's going to be able to perform at the upcoming shows that he's got scheduled. So, you know, if you've got tickets to some of the upcoming Ozzy shows, you may have to plan on rescheduling those or something of that nature, because he says he has a really deteriorating health Um in this interview that he conducted with Sirius XM, he said, I've never been this ill this long in my life. He said he's having a real hard time with his mobility, uh, saying that he's really frustrated with it. He says, I cannot, I can't begin to tell you how fucking frustrating life has become. It is amazing how you go along in life and one stupid thing can screw up everything for a long time. I've never been this ill this long in my life. Even when I was a downbeat, drunken drug addict, I would not be out this long. Well, I would say probably that, you know, if you abuse your body early on in your life, you're probably looking ahead for some hard times. I know, you know, a lot of the people that I knew when I was a younger man who did a lot of drugs, uh, either a lot of them didn't last very long or the ones that did kind of last a good while, you know, that didn't really have great health in their latter years. So, I mean, you know, let that be a lesson to you kids. Stay off the drugs. Stay off the drink if you can. Do not smoke. And you'll probably live a pretty good, long, healthy life if you take care of yourself. And eat right. Not that I'm one to talk. I've got crunchy cheese curls here that I've been snacking on this evening. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll end up like Ozzy at some point. Oh, there's so many women. So many women walk in. I'm not mentioning her name because I don't want to do that. Next up in the news, I thought this was kind of, you know, I, well, I say interesting. I, I use that word a lot. Sorry. Very interesting. I'm sorry! I, it was interesting enough for me to report on it. But here is another hotel that Hard Rock Cafe is building, this time in Las Vegas. Executives with Hard Rock International alluded to the plans when they purchased operations of the Mirage from MGM Grand Resorts. But new renderings were presented to the Nevada Gaming Control Board on Wednesday. The images show a new hotel that would put Treasure Island, Flamingo, and even Venetian Resort in its shadow. So this might be a situation where the neighbors, uh, you know, complain about this uh, if they're trying to get permission for this. You know, they did build one of these big ass guitar shaped hotels down in Florida. I I reported on it. You can check out. Uh, you can go check out the link. I just think that man, this is just a massive eyesore, and it's it just you know, for me, it kind of points to the if if a corporation is doing this with the with a guitar shape then it's almost like guitar has jumped the shark for me in some way. You know, I mean, 
I would, uh, I don't really don't, I hate to think that way, but you know, if they're building a freaking hotel casino in the shape of a guitar, something's wrong with it. You know, it's, it's, it's got too much of a, it's almost too big at that point. Right. I mean, it's not like they're building hotels in the shape of accordions. And that's the other thing too. It's like, how long will this, uh, continue to have this kind of appeal? You know, if, if, for instance, you know, if uh, they had built a hotel like this back in the during the day when accordion was, you know, real popular or a ukulele, you know, would we have had possibly a big accordion shaped hotel? <laughs> I mean, actually, an accordion shaped hotel would make more sense, wouldn't it? I mean, it would you, you could just see it like the bellows kind of stretched out. You know, you would have different balconies where the bellows go in and out and everything. I could actually almost see that in my mind's eye. A really cool looking uh, accordion ho shaped hotel. That's what they should do, you know, do a big accordion shaped hotel and just have Weird Al come be the resident performer every week. And man, you'd make probably tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I'm not running a casino or hotel. Next up in the news, I saw this story where this Peterborough police officer deploys a stun gun after a man attacks with a guitar. The police officer deployed a stun gun. I probably, you know, if I edit out the word stun gun, it's only because I've had situations in the past where I've been had my monetization limited over stupid stuff like this. I swear, YouTube will automatically demonetize something. If it even talks about some, you know, some kind of assault, I can't even use the word assault. Like even, I'm not promoting it. I'm not promoting violence. <laughs> I'm just talking about it as a news story and they'll still do this. So if you see me edit things in a really weird way, that's the reason why. So, you know, just please try to understand that. According to the Petersboro Police Service, around 10 p.m., officers responded to a reported disturbance at a residence in the area of... Uh, Kawartha Heights Boulevard? Where the hell is this? Police say officers were speaking to the parties involved when the suspect suddenly charged at the officer swinging a guitar. Poli He's lucky he wasn't shot and killed. Really. Police say officers commanded the suspect to stop, but he did not. One of the officers then deployed their conducted energy weapon. Don't tase me, bro! The suspect continued to resist arrest before officers were able to take him into custody. Uh, police say the officers involved suffered minor injuries. A 29-year-old Petersboro man was charged with assault with a weapon and two counts of assaulting a peace officer. So yeah, once again, we have learned, as I have discussed in the past, that guitars absolutely can be weapons and uh, they're used more times than you might think. Also in the area of crime with guitars, we see here a valuable guitar stolen from a main store. This is a funny, funny report because it's just so light on details and what details they do give are so misleading and uh, and just, just ignorant of the world of guitar that it's just kind of comical. Check this out. Police in South Portland are looking for a valuable rare guitar that was stolen from the Guitar Center store over by the mall. Police say the 1960 Gibson Les Paul guitar is worth $6,700. It has a distinctive tangerine color burst. Les Paul is one of the top electric guitar makers in the world. <laughs> Les Paul is one of the top guitar makers in the world. Did you guys know that? I didn't know that. I've been actually taught something today. <laughs> Also, it has a distinctive tangerine burst. And it is a 1960 Gibson Les Paul. You know what's going to be really confusing for these cops if they don't know anything about guitar? They're going to probably look up, like, the value of a 1960 Gibson Les Paul burst. And they're going to be like, man, this thing was is actually worth, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They must not know it. They're reporting it as, a, as like, a $6,000 guitar. Oh, it's just pretty funny. But it, it, it's funny. Uh, they actually have up here, if you want to... Call him. It says anyone with information should contact Officer Eric Young at E Young at SouthPortland.org. <laughs> so they leave their contact information up here. If you guys want to uh, send them a line and, and give them some information, I think they would uh, really appreciate any information that you have about Gibson Les Pauls. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, I'm going to apologize in advance to Officer Eric Young. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm just now seeing this article. Paul Stanley says, Kiss is far from done as final tour rages on. And it's funny, in the first paragraph, Paul Stanley predicts Kiss fans will still get to see the band in some capacity even after they complete their end of the road farewell tour. <laughs> I mean, oh, I've talked about this before. I mean, it's it, hell, it was like three years ago when I was still doing shit post Fridays. That one of my final shit posts, well, not even my final ones, it must have been three and a half years ago, maybe even going on four years ago. I reported, I'll, I'll put a link up here somewhere about uh, their farewell tour was going on then. And I talked then about how I saw them in the late 90s, I think it was, and they were on a, an, on a quote, farewell tour back then, even. So, shit, they've been saying farewell for 30 years almost. <laughs> Goodbye, Tin Man. Like for half of their career, they've been saying farewell. Uh, you know, not that I'm necessarily complaining. I mean, you know, there are worse bands that could just keep the ball rolling than Kiss, I guess. But it's just funny to me that they just can't, call, they can't seem to call it quits. How about just stop calling it a farewell tour and just go on tour, man? Really what they should do is just is get, like I said, get a residency somewhere with one of these hotels. Maybe they could get a hard rock hotel residency and just, you know, be there all the time and just kind of buy a mansion down the street and just pop into work, you know, get paid big time. Also from Ultimate Classic Rock, I thought this was a cool article. It was really, um, you know, bittersweet to see. Kind of like, you know, watching the Pantera stuff um, come back. It, you know, brings back a lot of memories and things like that. But I saw this. It was, you know, Quiet Riot. Uh, a Kevin Dubrow era Quiet Riot song was recently f discovered uh, back last year on a old iPod that somebody had. And uh, they actually apparently had the stems for it in, that were saved onto the iPod. And uh, they're actually releasing the a finished track that has been added to by Rudy Sarzo, who was um, their bassist early in the, their career, and uh, this guitarist named uh, Alex Grossi. So they went in and added a bunch of tracks and stuff to the tracks that were already laid down by Kevin Dubrow. Uh, Frank Benali also was drumming on this track, so it's, you know, the last of, uh, really the last track that's ever going to be released, probably of Kevin Dubrow and Frank Benali, who are both gone and rest in peace to both of them, man. I met Frank Benali one time outside of the Exit Inn in Nashville. Uh, went down there to see Wasp, and they I guess it was 04 ish, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, I was hanging out out back, and I, I didn't recognize him. I didn't recognize Frankie. Uh, but me and my friend were just standing there next to him uh, for like five, 10 minutes waiting for Blackie. He was going to come out of the tour bus, and my friend wanted Blackie's signature and stuff and he had a bunch of swag he wanted him to sign and we were kind of hanging out waiting and uh, my friend knew it was frank but i i didn't at first i was just kind of like you know just chatting to this really cool dude and you know found out a few minutes later that it was it was frank and i i guess it was just because he had changed maybe a clothes really quickly and he had gotten back out of the tour bus before i realized that he had changed clothes and uh yeah, stood there and talked to him for a good long while. He was a really cool cat, man. I, I remember. I don't remember the specifics of our conversation, but uh, I do remember that he was just a real laid back dude, man. He didn't didn't seem like he was taking his fame seriously or anything like that, or that he even thought of himself as famous. He just, you know, was like, yeah, man, I'm just jamming on drums, and here I am, you know, kind of thing. So, but I'll always remember that. He played on some of the uh, some of the best albums, you know, of the '80s and early '90s for me. The, the uh, the Crimson Idol, you know, and his drumming on the Crimson Idol is just fantastic. If you haven't checked that out, definitely check that out. But yeah, rest in peace, Frank and uh, Kevin Dubrow. And I'll put a link down below if you want to check out that new song. That is the final song uh, that they'll ever probably release. So, okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about this for a second. I, I don't know what's up with drones at rock shows, but here's another example of a drone at a rock show, Mike Patton uh, tries to knock this drone out of the sky using his microphone. You know, I think I get it that people 
you know, obviously you want to get the best shots that you can, you know, and a lot of people aren't satisfied with holding up your phone like this. And if you want, you know, good professional grade uh, video, that's the way to go, really. I mean, get yourself a drone and uh, fly the thing at the show if, if you can sneak it in. How are they getting the thing in? I don't I don't get it. I mean, because aren't usually aren't um, purses searched and things like that. I mean, to get into a rock show, I mean, it seems like you would have a hard time getting something like that in. But apparently some people are getting them in. Uh, Mike Patton tried to knock that drone out of the sky. And also it happened to Axl Rose not too long ago as well, as this article uh, talks about. It says, last month, Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose addressed drone flying fans on social media after noticing an increase in air traffic at the band's Australian shows. People were pissed, he explained. However much fun anyone's having... You're still trying to stay focused and do your job and give fans the best show you can. We get it. It can be fun to get your drone bootleg video, but we'd appreciate if anyone planning to do a drone pirate uh, took the fans and the band into consideration and play with your toys somewhere else. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. <laughs> you know, it's funny too. Uh, Axel Rose was recently in trouble for throwing his microphone in Australia. He actually hit this Australian woman in the face with his microphone at the end of the show. Apparently, it's been kind of his longtime thing at the end of the show to throw his microphone into the audience. It's kind of like a keepsake, you know, how drummers do it with their sticks. Well, he does it with his microphone, and he threw his microphone and hit this woman square in the face. And I don't know if she's going to sue the band or sue him personally or sue the insurance company for the venue, or I don't know what they're, she's going to do, but... I'm sure she's going to get something out of it because, you know, she got hit smacked pretty good. It looks like square in the face and, and she's right. You know, she talks in this article, uh, talking about it at, you know, if it depending on what microphone it is, uh, if it hit her square in the teeth, you know, it could have knocked all her teeth out. It could have, if it hit her in the eye socket, it could have knocked, it, she could have lost an eye. Um, when I was a kid, I was think I was about 11 or 12 years old. I was hit. Uh, I was hitting the face with a baseball bat, like right here. And actually it kind of it um, damaged my nose and it, it fractured fractured my cheekbone. And uh, you know, it I had a deviated septum for many years after that. And just something like that, just a, one injury like that can really affect you for life. So I don't know, man, she, she might be into Axel for some money on that one. He's now in Tossers Anonymous. <laughs> whatever that means. I guess it means he's uh, he's rehabbing from tossing microphones. He says he'll never do that again. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing, too. You know, everybody wonders, why did rock and roll become so tame? Why are rock shows so, so tame or so sterile and so predictable and stuff now? Or, you know, in uh, decades past, you know, there'd be all kinds of shenanigans and, and uh, just craziness and near riots and things like this and well I, that's exactly why it's because any band who wants to stick around for um longer than a few shows or a very very short career like you know somebody like jim morrison or something unless you're planning on dying you know soon you, you you're gonna watch your p's and q's a little bit and try not to get yourself sued you know and and uh so it's kind of ruined now you know he'll never be throwing microphones again so if you've got an Axl Rose mic where you caught it in the past, I guess uh, the value just went up because he he's already saying that he's not going to do that again. So, but I'm I'm really interested. Let me know what you think about the whole drones thing at concerts. You know, I mean, I've been the beneficiary, obviously. I'm sure a lot of you have too. You know, of of really of good concert footage that people have bootlegged that have been uploaded to YouTube, and I'm certainly appreciative appreciative of all that stuff when I get to see it. I mean, how else would I've gotten to see that first? and second Pantera show, for instance. But is it a bridge too far when you're taking the drones and you're actually flying over the crowd and getting real nice crowd shots and above shots and, um, you know, up close shots of the band and stuff? I mean, it seems to me like that would be the way that you would want to film a, a, a rock show, right? I mean, if, if um, and even if you're a band and you want to have your own show filmed pro kind of properly, isn't that what you would do? You would get, you know three or four people to fly some drones around during the concert. And that way you could, you know, have really nice stable uh, shots and, and all that stuff. I mean, seems to me that every band should do that for their set. They should hire some people 
to follow them around and get drone footage of all their stuff. I mean, and then, you know, take uh, just kind of as a default, you know, I'll just get a good recording off the board and then, you know, couple it with these with these shots and have your own YouTube channel, you know, take out the competition by doing it better yourself. That seems to me like the way to go. Just release all that stuff yourself. That way you don't, you don't have to rely on people bootlegging the stuff. Anyway, that's just my thought on it. What do you think? Let me know down below. We are coming up on the 20th anniversary of uh, some really great albums that were recorded back in 2003. 2003 was a great year for music, as far as I'm concerned. The Flaming Lips, they released Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, and that's coming up on its 20th anniversary. Uh, also, The Shins released Shoots Too Narrow that year, which I liked that album quite a lot. Uh, Bell and Sebastian, one of my all-time favorite albums, Dear Catastrophe Waitress, was released in 2003. Also, uh, Ben Gibbard of... Death Cab for Cutie, they, he released Transatlanticism with Death Cab for Cutie and also uh, the only album that was ever released with the Postal Service, Give Up, which is a was pretty much an instant classic, which I like both of those albums. I like a lot of different music, guys. I like everything from Pantera to Death Cab. I, I like a lot of stuff. Love the Flaming Lips. I mean, that is a great album. Yoshimi Battles of Pink Robots. If you guys haven't ever heard that, that's I mean, that's a classic. Everything that I just mentioned is a classic, and, I, and pretty much all these people are uh, still around and still touring, and as far as I know, they're all going to be doing 20th anniversary uh, tours in 2023, so definitely get out there and go see some of these guys who are uh, touring. I think particularly one, the one uh, I would kind of like to see would be the um, Transatlanticism and... Uh, Postal Service one because he's he's doing he's touring with both at once and I think even as a solo act he is Ben Gibbard is opening the show with Ben Gibbard his solo act so he's doing like three concerts in one um you know he's one of those guys I really don't I probably wouldn't jibe at all uh politically with the guy and, and you know wouldn't get along probably on a whole lot other than music but uh but I do like the guy's music and I can separate the two things. And, and, you know, it's the same with Bell and Sebastian. They're pretty left wing when it comes to a lot of stuff. And they're, you know, Stuart Murdoch's pretty outspoken on all that stuff. And it kind of turns me off. But, you know, I'm sure I, my opinions turn off a lot of people too. And I'm, it's, it is what it is. We don't have to agree on everything. But, you know, when I, I know good music when I hear it, I know good art when I hear it. And it's, you know, good stuff. Unlike some of the other leftists who just have pretty much shitty music and terrible ideas and no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Okay, now on to the biggest story that I found uh, this week. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Robbie Williams says is he's going to build a 20-foot fence between his and Jimmy Page's homes. So Robbie Williams... Uh, he's this songwriter. I had to look it up. I don't, you know, I've heard of the guy before, but I don't know any of his music or I didn't think I did, but I did Google it shortly after seeing this. I was like, who the hell is Robbie Williams? So I looked it up. His biggest hit was a song called, or his, I guess, signature hit was a song called Angel back in uh, the nineties. And I'll give you a clip of that here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I heard this I was like oh yeah I've heard that before and I was like but that reminds me of something else I was like what is it she offered me protection a lot of love and affection <laughs> and, I, and I and I figured it out I figured out what it is that it reminds me of a vision of perfection <laughs> an object of affection <laughs> to quench your to royal fire, fire. <laughs> That's exactly what that reminds me of. <laughs> I mean, you you tell me, you know, listen to him back to back. <laughs> so anyway, he is uh, doing some, he was wanting to do some renovations on this massive mansion that he owns, Robbie Williams was. And I, I guess what was holding him up is this feud he's been having with his neighbor, Jimmy Page. They live in these uh, adjacent mansions, essentially, uh, in London. And, you know, Robbie Williams being a, I guess, a famous guy and uh, I guess having his address kind of out there, you know, he probably sees a lot of people sort of wander by 
uh, craning their necks to look over his garden gate and you know he just wants a little more privacy and he wants to put up a wall and he's he's wanted this for like seven years they've been in this dispute for like seven years uh this says according to the sun a statement alongside the new application this is the application for his uh improvements and you know you can't do anything in england i mean if your house has any age to it at all which pretty much all houses in england do you have to ask the council and you have to basically bend over backwards and it takes years to get approval on any changes you want to do especially if you have some kind of uh graded listing on your house you know they have different grades um you know based on the age of your home and the historical importance and all this kind of stuff which you know british people you know you can do you do you man you know that's all your laws and stuff but that's definitely not for me somebody who believes in property rights like you know i i do i don't want to destroy history either but for god's sake if i buy a piece of property i want it to be mine and i don't want to have to ask for each little thing i ever want to do you know especially to some some little bureaucrat snake you know what i mean uh screw that you know have to jump through hoops and do a monkey dance for a bunch of just god bunch of control freaks really i wouldn't you know you guys can have it i don't want anything to do with it but anyway jimmy page and and uh robbie williams they have these adjacent mansions and according to the sun a statement alongside the new application for approval says it has been noted that due to the use of existing wall elements and the significant retention of soil within the plot, wall elevations are low and allow passers-by a view of the garden. As part of a proposed landscaping scheme, the designer has proposed the use of trellis panels as a low-impact way of increasing the privacy within the garden. So basically he wants to sit in his back garden and not be hounded by passers-by, right? Uh, and Jimmy Page has a problem with this. One of the things that uh, he wanted to do too was uh, he wanted to dig a basement in his house, I guess maybe as a wine cellar or something like that. Um, well, no, let's see. The highly publicized row between the pair began over seven years ago in 2015 when the former Take That member, I don't, I've never heard of the band Take That or the group, whatever it is. I've never heard of it before, before now. Anyway, he submitted plans for the renovations, which include an indoor pool, a gym, and underground passageway to the main house. So I guess he has like a, a garden shed or I don't know, or he had a gym out in his garden and he wanted to do an underground passageway into the house. I guess so he never had to poke his head out at all. Sounds like he's an agoraphobic in the making, but anyway, um, so Jimmy Page has since been battling with him and installing his plans for his su super basement over fears that vibrations from construction could ruin fragile ancient paintings and frescoes at his property. In 2018, Page told officials that he would fight against what he described as a threat to his mansion, which has been his home since 1972. Here's, here's the kicker right here. I mean, I went into this actually, you know, just by default being on Jimmy Page's side. It's like, you know, surely this this other dude is not in the right here. You know, he's got to be the asshole, right? Because, I mean, Jimmy's music is a lot better than this dude. So, surely, surely, uh, <laughs> surely Jimmy is the one in the right here. But no, uh, Jimmy Page just seems like the neighbor from hell to me. I don't think I would want to live next to Jimmy Page. I mean, you would think that Jimmy Page, of all people, would be okay with noise, a little bit of noise and a little bit of uh, ground shaking, right? I mean, he's got these massive amplifiers and stuff. Surely he'd want to crank them up every now and then and not have his neighbor complain. I mean, it goes both ways, right? Anyway, you would think that, but no, apparently not. It says here that despite Page's objections, Williams' renovation plans were reportedly given the go-ahead by the council on the condition that his builders use 19th century hand tools <laughs> to dig a to dig a pool and a fucking uh, 
passageway between two buildings. He has they have to use 19th century hand tools. And they have to have a 50,000 pound monitoring devices or not a th they have to have multiple, I guess, 50,000 pound monitoring devices to make sure the noise levels stay at a minimum. I mean, what a dick. <laughs> would... Oh, man. I don't think I would ever talk to Jimmy Page again after that. <laughs> you know, I'll just give you an example with my neighbor. My neighbor, his fence was about to fall into uh, my driveway at one point, it was actually collapsing over and, you know, a stiff breeze was going to blow this damn fence down and it was going to end up in my driveway or on my wife's car, you know, at some point. And so I told him about it. I was like, hey, Ron, you know, this, uh, you know, your fence is about to fall down, buddy. And uh, if you need me to help you, I'll help you, you know, fix it and everything. And he was like, okay, cool. So I, I, you know, I went out there and spent a Saturday, like a whole day, uh, or half day, whatever it was, helping him fix his fence, you know, and we we actually uh, dug down beside each post and like poured concrete and put new posts, you know, to help stabilize everything and uh, lag bolted them all in and everything and, you know, got it, got it just arrow straight again. And so he was thankful and, you know, it was just a good way to help a neighbor, right? That's the things you do to help a neighbor. You know, my neighbor on my other side, he... Now, these guys, they're probably really pissed at me, I'm sure, because of all the drumming that I do, because I have been drumming fairly consistently for about the past year or more, and a uh, little bit every day, you know, probably between 15, 15 minutes at least to 30 minutes a day, I kind of like to jump on the drums in the middle of the day. I never play past 8 p.m., which is when their kids will go to bed and stuff, but, you know, I mean, to try to... um you know, to, to, to try to smooth things over with them. You know, when I'm making cookies or something, I'll take them some cookies. Or if I notice that their yard is a little long, you know, I'll just hit hit their yard. You know, if I'm already out there doing mine, I've done that a time or two, and just little things like that. And they've helped me too. You know, and uh, you just try to get along with your neighbors, man. You don't want this kind of stuff uh, with neighbors. I don't understand. I mean, I, I I do understand it. It's just a different world, man. You know, it's a different world. But who would have thought, you know, Jimmy Page being the neighbor from Hill? I would have thought I would love to live next to Jimmy Page, but no, apparently not. Okay, that will do it for the news. Okay, the first lick of the week that I did uh, was fairly popular little segment, so I thought we would bring that back. And this time, uh, here is the lick of the week. It starts off with a little bit of a sweep pick. If you wanted to pick it, that is... I usually use fingers, um, and that's why my nails are so long. Some of you guys always ask, why are your nails so long? That's why. I'm going to do this first, uh, finger picking, and then um, I will go back with a pick, and I will show you how it's done with a pick as well. So it starts off with, uh, with this little run. Maybe I'll just show you the whole lick and then we'll break it down a little bit. So here's the lick. Show you again. So it starts off with a, um, a little bit of a sweet pick here. With the fourth fret on the G string, fifth fret on the B, third fret on the E, and then it goes up that blues scale there. And then it just does pull offs from there. And, but I do it with uh, finger picking, these first three. get it so it sees slowly the whole thing
And then, you know, when, once you build up the speed on that, uh, you kind of discover that you can start stringing lots of very similar ideas together. So one more time, here is the lick. And it may be hard to see what I'm doing exactly because I am using my fingers. So if you want to use a pick, I will show you it with a pick here. Whoops. So that's the lick of the week. All right, lads and ladies, that will do it for this shit post Friday. I hope you've enjoyed this one. If you have, hit subscribe down below. Please do share these because, like I said, my algorithm is really, really low right now, and it would really help me out if you guys would share it. Also, there are links down in the description if you want to help support the channel. Yeah, it just uh, every little bit helps. It really does. But that'll do it. And for now, y'all take care.